massive turnout today. Um, the reasoning, I bet, is to talk about this topic, the OUC, but Chris DeBona posted that he won't be able to join this meeting until um, 11.30, so like 25 minutes from now. Um, or Dan or Louis, like, should we, we should wait on discussing that topic towards the end, right? Or Probably do you want to get started idea. with that? Okay. We can do the other ones. We'll get into it. Um, you know, Chris is, is on the OUC and can talk about that. Certainly we have people on the STO steering here as well. So why don't we do the other topics first, because that will clearly take the, uh, the rest <laughs> of the time. So okay, sure. I, I, think that's, I think that's the right thing. And Chris will join at some point. We don't have to wait for Chris. Okay. All right. That sounds good. Um, you can see my screen uh, I'm sharing today. Yes. Okay, cool. So we'll start off, you know, as usual, like talking about the, the current releases that are being built. So 1.7 status. Um, for those that don't know, there is um, a wiki where you can keep track of the release, you know, get information about when the feature freezes, July 17th, and then branch cut is the July 21st. And in about a month after the two testing days, um, end of July and beginning of August, you should um, expect a release um, on August 11th, which is around a month from now. Um, you can see the release manager's information if you uh, about the Slack channel if you have any questions. And um, I wanted to show you some of the, I don't know, noteworthy things that are going to be part of this release. Um, Istio does run a pretty tight ship now. Um, so like weekly, the working groups report the status of the, of the features that they're working on to the technical oversight committee. So this uh, spreadsheet kind of shows you all the major features that each working group is working on. Um, and then from here, you can you know, see information about the current status of it, the release type, uh, if there's a, a design doc, and then link to the actual GitHub issues where the work is actually taking place. Um, some things that stood out for me is the multiple control plane support. So this includes um, not just running multiple control planes for multi-tenancy, but also there's work going on for to do um, canary upgrades using uh, multiple control planes. Um, Helm v3 support um, going further down. There's stuff around VM support and just general multi-cluster improvement as far as docs and testing going on. Um, central STOD, uh, it's a, a new concept, the sub area of multi-cluster. I'll kind of provide a quick overview um, of, of what that is and how that fits in with the existing shared and uh, multi-control uh, plane options. For the networking working group, uh, updating Envoy to the, the latest v3 API. Um, and then scrolling down, um, stabilizing Istio CNI support. Uh, this has been a uh, work in progress for, for a while, but I think the priority of this has, uh, has increased for this uh, release. Scrolling down for user experience. Um, a lot of these things are around using Istio CTL for um, installation. So uh, removing a profile or a manifest that you've applied using Istio CTL manifest remove. Um, we've had install for 1.6, and so now we're, we're going to have a remove. Um, promoting Canary version of Istio upgrade to master, and then um, some more things around central Istio D. For test and release, uh, improvement of uh, base image vulnerabilities. I think this just has to do with uh, us doing vulnerability scans more often on the base images so we can uh, pick up the latest faster. Um, and then scrolling down, uh, multi-cluster single Istio D certificate provisioning. This has to do with if you're running Istio D on a different cluster, being able to provision the certs for the remote cluster and, and sending it to it. And then telemetry enabling full V2 transition. Um, so nothing in here that stands out for me. So when we do have people from TOC, so if there's anything that I missed, um, feel free to probably, jump in. Sorry, yeah, probably one of the more impactful things is the better transport security stuff, which will likely be in some form of alpha. Mm -hmm. um, so this is actually quite an important feature uh, in how we uh, basically tunnel traffic through MTLS, um, 
throughout the mesh. Um, there are issues with using MTLS exclusively as the means of tunneling traffic. Right? MTLS provides all the security properties that we want, but we also need a mechanism to exchange metadata between producers and consumers of services in the network, particularly to facilitate policy and telemetry, right? Um, and so uh, this is looking at using um, HTTP mechanism in addition to MTLS, right? So as a wrapper around not just HTTP traffic, but also TCP traffic, uh, which HTTP2 is actually quite well designed to do. Uh, and then you can use the metadata exchange mechanisms in HTTP2 to pass that additional information around the network. Um, so this is this is an incremental improvement uh, and actually allows us to do a variety of other different things at the networking layer uh, moving forward in the project that should actually make the product simpler uh, and solve some of the, the internal architectural issues that we have. Um, now, one of the, the impacts that this feature has is that uh, the tunnel, this MTLS plus HTTP2 tunnel that we will implement will actually live on a reserved port, just like uh, the sidecar actually captures traffic on a reserved port, um, which has some implications for how people use network policy to constrain traffic between pods, because now if your traffic is going over this tunnel, right, it will be going on a reserved port. Um, on, in some ways that makes it easier to write policies, right? Because you can just constrain access to that port, like if you're using Kubernetes network policies. But on the other hand, because it's a tunnel, right? You can't differentiate by port for traffic, right? So then you should be using the Istio authorization policies to constrain traffic. Um, so that's kind of the, the trade-off that this feature represents. Um, one of the major advantages is if you're using a system that tends to create a lot of TCP connections, right now you're getting a lot of it TLS negotiations, uh, because we do one per TCP connection. Uh, with this, you'll get one TLS negotiation per producer consumer pair in the network, right? So from a performance perspective, uh, we do actually see, expect to see some sizable gains for systems like HTTP 1.0, but also things like Redis and Mongo that tend to be a little connection happy. Uh, rather than using multiplexing within their own internal protocol. So this actually fixes a bunch of performance related things. Uh, and, and this idea is, it, you know, it's actually moderately common within the industry. Uh, at Google, we use something like this for traffic between theirs of proxies. You know, when traffic comes into Google, the edge of Google's network, we multiplex it hop by hop. Uh, and in general, we've seen pretty substantial performance benefits for certain traffic classes doing this. Uh, and we, we don't really expect to see any performance loss for the existing traffic patterns already being tunneled over MTLS today. Uh, but this will be an alpha feature, uh, but it is quite an important part of the roadmap. So I'm happy to take questions about this or if people want to go off and think about it and come back later, that's totally fine, or just ping me offline. Um, but there's, there's uh, as Ram was showing, there's some good content in the design doc that explains what's happening. Is the sheet in the design doc in the Istio community Google Drive? So like viewable? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, it's also attached to the, uh, what is it? Uh, the working group, the weekly meeting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's in the drive. And it's updated yeah. quite regularly. Shweta does a pretty good job of that. Yeah, and I can link. Uh, we, we can put a link. Do you, yep. you want to put a link in the, in the chat window nice. there, Ron? Yeah, or in the, uh, the uh, Google Doc, the uh, community meeting working doc, which I have open as well. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's fine. Uh, is there anything else folks want to highlight? Um, you know, there are, there are other things that aren't super big in terms of impact within Istio, but you know, we, we are like, for instance, upstreaming the WASM work into Envoy, mm -hmm. right? That's, you know, while the WASM work is being done by people within the Istio community, we're doing it for the benefit of Envoy in general as well. And so it will be upstreamed into Envoy. And so if you use Envoy for other things, right, the, you know, you can expect to start leveraging that. Um, you know, it's not strictly timed to the Istio release, but it's a thing that's happening in this window.
Um, CNI is pretty material to people. Um, you now we've certainly had plenty of conversations with companies that like using CNI rather than pod injection because it gives a bit more control over the injection of Envoy to the kind of mesh administrator and takes it out of the hands of kind of the, the workload owner, right? And so organizations that have, you know, tighter control boundaries about who's allowed to opt into or out of a mesh, right, like that property. But CNI has issues that we've had to work through uh, to make it stable and reliable. Uh, Everything else is fairly incremental. Uh, well, one thing we are working hard on is making the, the, the existing extension API, Envoy filter, uh, a stable API for upgrade, right? So if you're using the extension mechanism to inject some custom behavior into the mesh or into traffic, right? That's not part of the, the, the base set of Istio APIs. Maybe you wrote a WASM filter or something like that, or, or using Lua or, some other, you know, pr proprietary feature, or not proprietary, but other feature in Envoy that we don't model in the APIs. That's how you do it today. Uh, we describe that API as being break glass, which means that, you know, we don't guarantee it works after upgrade because of how it operates today. We're trying to provide some more stability around that. Um, yeah, that, that's mostly it. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff, but. I don't think we should spend the whole meeting. So I'm just right. trying to pick yeah. out topics of interest. Yeah, I try to highlight some of the, the I guess the more appealing ones that, that stood out to me, but there's definitely a lot of work going on. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, link, uh, I'll link this in the community meeting doc if, if someone hasn't done that already, when you can kind of take a look. Um, yeah, any other questions? If you have questions, that stuff in here, just dump it in the chat. And, yep. Yeah, good answer. Cool. Um, so this next topic, OEC, we decided we're going to talk about soon. Um, and then uh, I wanted to spend a couple minutes uh, introducing Central um, Istio D. Uh, so just as a background, so as you know, in, in our multi-cluster installation, uh, doc page. We currently document two different patterns. There's the like the replicated control plane pattern where if you have two clusters, each one of the clusters has a full con Istio control plane, all the all the components basically. And then um, basically the users get to pick and choose what services they want to kind of export and consume. And, um, and they both use the same root CA so that uh, there's trust between the two sidecars and the traffic goes through, you know, if you want an egress gateway and then the ingress gateway on the remote cluster. Um, and then in the shared control plane model, um, you only have the control plane functions, most of them are in one cluster, right? Your, your main cluster, the one on the left, and then you extend it with cluster two, the remote cluster on the right. Um, and, and technically that cluster also has like STOD running, but that Istio D only provides it features that are needed for that for the data plane to run on that cluster. So things like sidecar injection and and base, and the certificate um, distribution services. Um, the way you apply the Istio config, you know, like resources, et cetera, you still have to apply it to the cluster um, cluster on the left. And then, um, like, so if you had gateways and stuff, for example, you know, traffic would come through a cluster one on the left, and then your downstream services can be on, on either services. Uh, the two clusters, they can be on a flat network using, if you already have a flat network or a VPN, or if you don't have a flat network, you can have multiple networks. And then um, you can use, again, egress and ingress gateways to basically hop through the, the gateways. Um, so both of these are documented patterns that, um, that work well. Um, so Istio D, I mean, central Istio D has to do with, um, so if you had two clusters, let me pull up the diagram real quick. So let's say you had two clusters, like cluster one on the left and then cluster two on the right. And you want the cluster on the left to be a dedicated control plane cluster, meaning that you're not planning on running any of your workload on that cluster. 
And then, but all your workload, you plan on running it on the cluster on the right, which is like your, your data plane cluster. Um, so think of the left one as only a control plane cluster and the one on the right is data plane. So this is good if you have like two different roles, right? So the control plane cluster could be like a mesh admin um, that is only responsible for installing the, the control plane aspects of the Istio uh, deployment, of uh, the Istio installation. And then the stuff on the right would be just the data plane related stuff. So things like the ingress gateway. And then the things that you need um, for uh, Istio to work from the data plane side, like webhook configurations. Um, a key difference here is that when you're applying your Istio resources, like virtual services, gateways, destination rules, et cetera, you apply it to the cluster on the right. So the cluster on the left now needs a, a, an installation of, of Istio D that is able to listen to the Kubernetes API from the cluster on the right, the remote cluster. Um, and this cluster on the, on, on the left doesn't need any of the data plane stuff. Um, so this model lends really well for, um, for also for vendors to provide Istio as a service, for example. So if you don't want, if you want to provide Istio D as a service, and then you don't want your users, your data plane users, your, your application developers don't want any access to, to Istio D, then this model works uh, really well. So Istio D, central Istio D has to do with creating this, um, this component that's able to run kind of independent of all the things that you need to run the Istio uh, data plane. Um, there's various extensions of this model being able to run multiple Istio Ds on the control plane cluster, and then each Istio D can support you know, a, a different remote cluster. Um, you can have one Istio D running on the control plane cluster supporting multiple remote clusters. Um, some of those clusters can have Istio config, so call it like the config cluster, and some of them uh, might not have any Istio config, but they still need uh, like sidecars, et cetera. So that's what um, this work is about. Um, there's a couple of design documents already uh, that are currently being uh, worked on. Um, the reason why I'm, I'm introducing this is that if you have any feedback for this type of deployment model, then uh, now's a really good time to get involved. Um, there's a central Istio D uh, design doc, and then from this, uh, another design doc got stemmed out to focus on just one of these patterns. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's under a simplified central Istio D. So I'll link to these as well. And I think that you know once the the pattern is more further developed, um, so right now the the work is focused on building the the building blocks, basically the sub components that are needed to make this work. Um, so that will evolve to profiles and then eventually um, be a, a working solution, um, probably on the, on the documentation page. But um, kind of still in uh, early phases. So we just wanted to introduce this concept to users that that might find it interesting and potentially provide feedback to see if this type of model you know, makes resonates with you, if your administration you know, would be interested in this control plane, um, Istio D. Um, these doc talks about the various roles and responsibilities of each type of uh, user that would be using this type of pattern. Uh, this is cool, Ram. Uh, I have a question because I, I know that we have some uh, solutions architects who have recommended if it's an architecture like this running a control plane in its own cluster, maybe regionally, and then you might be running different clusters in different zones within that. <clears throat> um, have you identified any engineering work that needs to happen here, or is this all essentially profiles and documentation to make this happen? Um, there is engineering work that's, that's actually already started. Um, I think you know, Iris, Lynn, and Greg Hansen um, were the leads on this design doc, um, and I and they've identified a bunch of engineering work that needs to be done in order to have this pattern run successfully. Um, you know, basically simplifying Istio D for the pieces on the left so that it's only doing the things that are needed for the control plane and then simplifying all the data plane side so that the cluster on the right only has those data plane components, um, those, those base building blocks, building of those, and then putting them into a profile or a component um, later. So like this is, I think, uh, Lynn's um, work item 22934 does a good job kind of having an overview of all the work that needs to be done to get this thing done. That's but master think, inventor, Lynn, to you. 
yes, mess. <laughs> I don't know if she's on the call. If she is, then I will call her out. But I'm not sure if it's a good time for questions, but I've put out a question on the document in regards to replicated control plane. So feel free to take that later on if it's okay. Sure. Um, are there any more questions about this centralized DoD pattern? I basically, you know, told you everything I know about it. So I don't know if I can answer any more questions, but there are people on this call that will be. Go ahead. I think there was a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Hey, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, my question is in regards is to multi-cluster in the replicated control plane. So in my simplified use case, I have two Kubernetes clusters, let's call it like one and two. And these Kubernetes clusters, they are a mirror of each other in terms of workloads. They're running the same service names and the same namespace names. So if I follow the instruction on the Istio docs to create a dot global stub zone, I'll end up with name collision in my setup. So I thought that I could go ahead and rather than have a single dot global zone, I would have one, let's say what cluster one zone for my cluster one and one cluster two zone. And I would configure my service entries according, the core DNS integrator according. And that, that way I would call my service dot namespace dot cluster name, which will be cluster two from cluster one, rather than having a single uh, zone. Is that something that will work? Is that a hard stop in that approach that you can think of? So generally an alternative to my approach to. So, so generally, what we, we, we have done is we, if services have the same logical name, we have treated them as the same service, right? Regardless of where they physically are, right? Because the cluster is a physical construct, not a logical one. Um, and we've done that because most people have these use cases where, right, I have 10 clusters, they're running different mixes of the same services, right? And they tend to move workloads around between these clusters, but they still want everything to be able to communicate. So that's kind of what we optimized for, right? Which leads us to this situation, right? Where if you have a situation where you have two services running in two different cl clusters with the different name and they are different things, not the same thing, right? Then you have an issue, right? Because Istio wasn't optimized for that. So I guess the first question I have is, if everything has the same name in the same organizational structure, are they really different or are they the, logically the same thing? We, we partition our data. So the a service okay. that's being run in, in Europe versus US cannot handle the same requests. Yeah, so that's that's pretty actually a pretty common thing, right? Um, now, uh, Kubernetes, right, has this behavior where all services by default, right, get .cluster.local. Right, and that's the DNS name. In reality, what you have is dot cluster dot New Zealand and dot cluster dot Turkey, right? And they have different names. And so that actually works with Istio, right? There's there's some pain because of setting up different cluster DNS suffixes, right? And the assumptions. But if you have dot cluster like dot cluster dot New Zealand and dot cluster dot Turkey, and you put those services in the same mesh. Right, they can still talk to each other right through the mechanisms that we have, but they have different names because they're different logical things. Okay. Uh, so the the duck global thing is not something that's actually built into Istio. It was just in the in the example that was a pattern that you so, referenced. But so the specifically the dot global suffix on DNS lookup does manifest in a couple of places, in particular in the Helm charts that that get realized in some of the DNS lookups that are performed in pods, and then in the literal implementation of the core DNS plugin itself, and some of the configuration that goes there. So today it is set up to only support exactly one domain for that use case, and you would have to do extra work if you wanted to have many subdomains. In general, what Louis is suggesting, where you name your clusters uniquely, is a much more robust solution to this in general, I think. Yeah, so Duck Global is really an attempt to make the naming line up with the reality. Right, that Istio treats services with the same name as globals, mm -hmm. right? And then you use load balancing policies to control how traffic routes based on geographic needs, costing needs, et cetera, et cetera. And then separately, you can have different logical service names and address them, right? So the doc global thing is really just trying to name reality correctly, right? And that's actually that's something that Kubernetes itself is trying to do, right? There are other projects looking at doing a similar thing. I think they or called it supercluster, right? 
so I can probably remember. Uh, there's a similar effort anyway. Um, because everybody recognizes I don't remember the name there's, a, there's a problem with docluster.local, right? Uh, and it's generally not, it's not good practice to just randomly create colliding DNS names, right? Because it's going to cause confusion at some point down the road. Um, so that's what this is about. Now, but unfortunately, there are a lot of people who have had clusters running for a long time that have docluster.local as their name and they can't fix it, right? So they need to alias, right? They can't change uh, in place. So, so you're recommending on each of our 10 clusters, not using .cluster.local anywhere, and instead every has its own uh, unique TLD or, uh, or you know, domain effectively? Yes, there, there, are, there have been friction points with doing that, but essentially, yes. You're, you're, if your services are different things, they should have different DNS names. Okay. Because because right, otherwise you you will have a collision at some point right where something will talk to something else that it shouldn't have. Um, or you can just run. Or the alternative is policy is, yeah, policy is really hard to write. Otherwise, is the short answer, right? When things don't have consistent names, you have to specialize policy to each location, uh, and so you lose the ability to write a general policy that works. Is yeah. maybe another so the, 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 another way to get at it. Okay. Right. So the workaround is to alias, right? If you need something in New Zealand to talk to something in Turkey, right? You, you have a separate mesh for each one, but you create an entry in each mesh that basically aliases the thing in the other one, right? And then you talk through the gateways. That, that still works, right? And you right. can do that selectively. So you don't have to do it for everything. You just have to do it for the things that you care about, having cross-cluster communication. But it's, it's more set up, right? Because you have to go and create a mapping yourself. Sure, yeah. But it does work. Okay. Thanks for addressing it. It really clarified a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a common issue. And, and the Kubernetes in general is trying to deal with this as well. Right? It's, it's, it's not just an Istio problem. Yeah, this is fundamentally the fact that a Kubernetes name is local to a cluster, right? And that's which they need to fix. Yeah, and like Tim Hawken had that doc about like there's several ways that people think of multi-cluster and how they interact. Yeah. Yeah. Tim and I have had long conversations about this. We, but we, yes, pick names carefully is probably the first piece of advice and pick them when you start with your cluster. So there, there's another question here from Nicola, but I'm wondering if we should agree to have someone take that up with Nicola offline, because uh, I do want to allow uh, plenty of time. How much time do you think you'll need? Because I, I invited Steve to, to, to address this question. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I just wanted to give him like like five minutes to, to address this question, and then and then we can move. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so do I have the floor then? Yes. Go ahead. Steve. Okay. Oh. Cool. So hi, Nicola. I'm Steve. Uh, I'm work group lead for environments. And let me share my screen real quick so you can see what I've got going on. Um, sorry. Share screen. Host disabled attendee screen sharing. So, um, so, so just to s summarize the question, the question was around upgrading from like 1.4 to 1.5, right? Um, the question was, so hello everyone, I'm Nicola. So just to summarize, so question is, we are now on 1.5 and we want to go to 1.6. 1.5 has been installed using L chart, so no, not with the Istio CTL commands. So we are kind of struggling understanding how we can do a no downtime upgrade to 1.6 because I find found around some guide uh, that it's supposed to explain how to do it, but the Google Doc it's not accessible. I saw other people asking for access from their official documentation, so. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if there is a clean way to do an upgrade for 1.5 installed with pure Elm files or through Elm charts. The answer is yes, Nicola. Um, if I could share my screen, I would give you a demo, but I can't uh, because it's disabled in Zoom. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll put a link to uh, the preliminary documentation on how to do this. Um, it would be nice at some point uh, just uh, to give a demo of how the revision tech in Istio works. I don't have to do it today. We can do it maybe in the next community meeting. 
but I think a lot of people would benefit from understanding how this, like seeing, how, seeing this in action uh, very quickly. Um, takes about five minutes, but uh, I don't want to disrupt the meeting at the moment okay. because I'm, I can't share. So, so, uh, so Steve, why don't you, yeah, you want to put that link in for now? Yeah, to the, that, that sure. talks on prelim.sto.io. It's not. Yeah, easy. it is. I'll, I'll put it, I'll put it in chat and then I'll add it to the, uh, to the agenda so people can see it and it uh, should merge shortly. I think it's coming along quite nicely. I made you host, so maybe you can share now. Okay. Let me try that. But uh, yeah, I mean, we are on a, on a time. Oh, nice. Limit, so. Okay. So desktop, uh, there we go. It should. Okay. So there we go. Um, this is a preliminary documentation down here, way down at the bottom. Uh, actually Martin, Martin put this together. Or some documentation upgrading from 1.4 and then um, upgrading from Helm installations. Now I'm not going to go through this actually because this is just really preliminary, really rough. I, am, I do want to show people the um, how revisions work. It's really straightforward. So um, real quick, I just did a quick demo. And make you you can't beat that, Steve. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there you go. Uh, get the pods. So we'll see. I've got, uh, um, I've got book info running. Um, like if I do a Kube cuddle get service dash and we can see what uh, we'll see it. our load balancer is here. So wow, it's really hard to cut and paste across lines like that. Just type it in. So 52.116.154.0. Okay, so we see we got the product page. I'm running 1.5 here, and the way we can tell that is if I run Istio Cuddle-157 version, it'll come back with the data plane is, we've got eight proxies running 1.57. And what a lot of people want to do is they want to upgrade their control plane independently of their data plane. We find this commonly, and what we're running now for our control plane is 1.57 of Istio. I'm going to install the one, uh, control plane and um, now we follow documentation I want people to understand this stuff is documented so uh, really the thing that matters here is this dash 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 set revision canary um, so let me let me just uh, install but I'm not going to install with that revision name I'm gonna call this version 164 so very straightforward oops uh, it's still cuddle you have two T's. Yeah, yeah, I got it. And I missed this all. The love of, yeah. So this will, uh, this will install a control plane of Istio 164. And then if I, it takes just about 20 seconds. And keep in mind when you're upgrading from Helm, you would use the same pattern. There's a little tweak at the beginning that you have to change. But after, once you transition from Helm to this, then you can always use this model. If you want to stay on Helm, uh, we have plans for that in the future, but not right at the moment. Uh, we spoke about that in the intro, but I do want to just focus on the revisions tech for now. So uh, it takes a little mo moment to get through the install. I'll install sometime this year. I thought you had a fast bare metal, Steve. Yeah, you know, I'm running on, uh, on IKS at the moment because my, I installed vSphere on my yeah, bare metal and it's uh, not working. Anyway, 164 version. So um, we'll see that we've got six proxies on 157. We've got two proxies on 164. The two proxies running on 164 are in the Istio system namespace. One of them, them is Istio Ingress. We see it was restarted 53 seconds ago. The other one is connected to Prometheus because there's a Prometheus pod and has a sidecar associated with it. So <clears throat> we've got two proxies on 164, six on 157, we just go down here. You can read a little bit of the docs. This is like describing how you tell if your stuff is actually enabled. I think the most important part is this, this right here. So uh, we just wanna label the namespace and we're just using the default namespace so we don't even need to type that, but we wanna turn off injection and then it's do io dash rev slash slash rev slash rev equal three one six four. And what's this, what's this, what this does is this tells the control plane when we do a rolling restart, which is what we're gonna do next. It tells 
tells the control plane to to assign and inject the sidecar version that the control plane matches. So if I do a kubectl rollout, and all this rollout restart does is restart all the deployments in the default namespace. So if I do a kubectl get pods, let's see, we've got a bunch of in the net and a bunch of them running. The ones that are running are 164, the one in the net are in, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the one in the net is 164, the one running is 15. So if I do a uh, kubectl, um, Excuse me, if I do uh, Istio Cuddle version, we'll see that uh, some of the data plane is starting to transition over. So we've got four proxies on 157, we've got five on 164, and you can have like 15 versions of control planes on your system at once, which is really cool. So we'll see some, all of the proxies are gonna transition from 157 to 164. Now, a, a question that comes up commonly is what happens with the ingress? So now everything is transitioned to the 164 data plane. We look at the book book info here, store, and it's still running. Um, so it's still running. Everything is great. So uh, common question is what happens with the with the ingress? Uh, now ingress it has a deployment, but it's also a service. So the service retains its IP, its external IP, but the deployment restarts. So one last thing, I'm gonna get the pods for the uh, Istio system namespace, and then I'll just delete. I want, to, I want people to see there's an Istio D version 164, that's what I just deployed. I'm gonna delete the deployment of the old one, Istio D, and we'll still see everything is lovely. Let's delete deployment. Yeah, Istio system. You can tell I haven't practiced as much. Delete deployment is to system. Uh, it's still D, should be pod, pod. D only. Yeah, just What's that? Yeah, I made the name of the pod there. Oh, you need yeah, the deployment right. name. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so you, if you want to remove this stuff, we're adding deletion, but it's not there yet. So we see two deployments, SGOD and SGOD version 164. So if I'm just, you can just uh, delete the deployment, SGOD. And then uh, I get the, now we expect people to use uh, CI for this stuff. And I expect people to like type a million commands. And we'll see the versions there. And one thing that's different is the control plane is gone now for one five and we can still refresh and everything's great golden. Okay, that's my demo. If you have questions, come to the environments working group meeting. We can handle your detailed questions there. I just want people to understand this is how we expect upgrades to happen in the future is using this uh, revisions technology. And I love it. I think it's phenomenal. The greatest thing I've ever seen in like 20 years of uh, engineering. It's that great. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, that, really that's, like that's, uh, that's amazing. My question is, now I'm running 1.5 with, uh, without Istio D, so because installing it with the uh, old uh, Fashionet uh, ERM file, I'm, I'm still having my Istio pilot, Istio telemetry, whatever. Is this changing? Is this preventing me to do the same as we demonstrated in this demo? Yeah, so telemetry. Um, hey guys, is it would it be all right if we take that that offline? Yeah, sure, that'd be fine. Um, sure. Can we? Yeah, can you come to the environments working group meeting? I'll drop a link in the chat, or not in the chat, in the uh, community meeting working doc of how to join that. Uh, I think you would get a lot of value out of that if you have detailed questions like that. Yes, thanks. Cool. Okay, thank you. Now, um, thanks, don't know how to give back uh, command. You have any ideas? Um, Let me stop. You sharing. can probably just stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I stopped sharing. I can make somebody else the host. Uh, thank uh, you. I, don't, well, I don't know if we'll need, I don't know if there are any demos going forward. We might not need, uh, okay. need well, any sharing. Uh, I kind of like the we background that's up there right now, but you know. We, we, we are still seeing your screen, Steve. Sorry, I thought I stopped sharing. It's very pretty. Yeah. Luckily, you didn't switch over. And uh, hey, joining us. So, so uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't switch over to anything. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that.
Uh, so, so we're joined today by Chris DeBona. Chris uh, is in the um, uh, open source program office here. He runs the open source program office here at Google. Uh, he is also on the board of the recently created Open Usage Commons. Um, and uh, the last item on the agenda is the um, donation of the Istio trademark uh, from Google to the Open Usage Commons. Um, I think there was a particular question about it, but uh, I think it was more of a discussion item than anything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chris, do you want to tee this up? Sure. Um, just uh, hi, everyone. I'm Chris. I look after open source uh, licensing, standards, compliance, tooling uh, for Alphabet uh, across the conglomerate. We, uh, we've been releasing software for a very long time. We uh, did our first patches in 99, and we've released somewhere around 13,000 projects since my start in 2004. Uh, we have about 3,000 30-day active projects. And what this means, and I'm not doing this to puff myself up, maybe a little. Um, but what this means is that uh, we end up hitting the little corner cases of intellectual property uh, in open source kind of before anyone else. And sometimes those interactions are in the courts, <laughs> you know, and so uh, over the last, I, I want to say about three or four years, um, with the rise of our uh, filing way more trademarks in the open source space, we started having more complicated discussions about what it means to open source something that has a trademark register. So uh, starting, I don't know, late last year, we're like, okay, maybe the answer here is we put together guidance for open source projects uh, around what does it mean to have a trademark be open source in accordance with the open source definition and the Debian free software guidelines. Because we don't want any of our projects, the project like Istio, Angular, Garrett, whatever, uh, any of our projects to end up inside, say, the Debian non-free category, right, which would be pretty bad for uh, the software getting out there because it's, you know, I like to think about where does software come from? Where the, where do the developers end up using it? When do, where do the deployers end up using it? And um, it's interesting when things end up getting marked non-free in Debian, let's just say. Anyway, uh, so uh, the approach evolved over the six months or so, and then COVID happened and work from sheds happened. Um, and we decided to put together a external body that is not under Google's you know, exclusive control. We uh, have two people on the board of directors of the OUC of the six. And uh, we put uh, with the goal of basically presenting that guidance for open source projects that have trademarks. And then if we're successful at that, we want to talk about what it means when you have hardware intellectual property, which is actually pretty different from patents and copyright and how we can make sure that that's being released in, again, in accordance with the open source definition. But we're gonna start really small and just with trademarks. And the other side of this is we're like, listen, if we don't do it ourselves, if we don't actually have skin in the game, no one's gonna care, uh, you know, in the world of sort of corporate trademarking and, and licensing, if we don't, take things that matter a lot to the company and put them into this uh, independent body, then no one's going to give a crap. They're just going to say, yeah, we don't care what they do. Um, so that's where we came up with the idea of Istio, Angular, and Garrett being put into this thing. So what does it mean for the Istio community? Uh, actually, very little. Um, if anything, it's uh, an opportunity for us to give really good clarity around what it means to use the Istio trademark. Uh, what if you want to create an Istio API equivalent? Can you use the word Istio? Can you use the, the sale? And, and we aim to answer all of those questions in a way that's compatible with open source distribution. So we tried to do this before uh, in Istio and actually in, in, in a number of other projects from the Google perspective. And it was always, everything is its own special snowflake. And there wasn't a really standard way of doing it. And it was always fraught with, with difficulty. Um, and so we decided to push it out on this new organization as a safe space to experiment with uh, trademarks and open source. So happy to take any questions. Um, and yeah, hi.
And of course, we also have members of the steering committee from uh, both IBM and uh, Google on the call as well. Yeah. W one thing I'd like to be clear about is that this, it, Chris kind of said this, this is not changing the governance of the project, certainly yeah. not changing the lens of the software. Yeah. This is a trademark uh, donation only. Um, and and I, I just want to be clear about that, that that this is not changing the governance. This isn't a new organization that's taking over the project. It is still have the same steering committees, the same TOC that we had uh, two days ago. Yeah. And also, I, I would point out, it, it's actually uh, incumbent on the STO steering committee uh, and the STO community developers to take part in what we're eventually going to probably call the STO trademark escalation group. Um, uh, over at the OUC because there's going to be some areas that are going to be very SDO specific, I think, that we need to make sure that we're covering. Um, again, in accordance with the open source definition. So um, if anything, we, we need the SDO uh, steering committee and, and the community to be very effective and, and good at communicating. So. So I guess one one key question, why a separate legal entity and why an existing foundation wasn't sufficient? So I, I'm going to be really frank about this, Dan, because uh, I think that y'all deserve. Um, if you look across uh, the organizations that Google has funded for the last 15 years, you have the CNCF, the LF, which we actually helped create, uh, the W3C, the IETF, the IEEE, the SFC, the SFLC, which we no longer fund, but used to. Um, and honestly, I think last time we checked, we were members and board members of and contributors to something like 30 different organizations of size. And some of those groups will not work with the other groups. Some of them find working with the other groups anathema. And so, and, and 201, uh, well, not all, of them, but many of them were, when we told them what we were doing, they're like, oh, I'm glad that you guys are doing it because we don't have the time. We don't have the money. We don't have the structure, right? And so they would love for us to succeed or fail uh, independently. Um, and so when I talk to groups like Debian, when I talk to groups like uh, uh, sort of the, the more, you know, poppy left oriented people, they're, they're really excited. Uh, that we're doing this because they've seen what people have been doing with trademarks in these groups and it's been anathema. Uh, Debian has gone so far as to actually delist projects from the Debian app repositories because of what they've been doing with trademark. Uh, this is a long-winded way of saying that, you know what, uh, we know that there are groups that would love to see this be part of the CNCF or part of the W3C, um, uh, but we decided to go independent. So there you go. Thank you. Sure. Chris, do you want to talk for a second about, right? Because I think the OUC has made it very clear that they don't have a technical agenda. Right? So specifically, we, we've made it clear that we're not in the business of running conferences. Uh, we're not a, a marketing organization. There is a discussion on the technical side where, so suppose Istio comes up with a conformance test. Okay, what does that mean for somebody who wants to say that they are conformant with the Istio API, for lack of a better term? Um, and, and that's part of what we want to work with the Istio steering committee to sort of figure out what's the, what's, how do we thread the needle for the open source definition and the Debian free software guidelines in a way that, so if you run the conformance test and it comes out that you've passed for some future version of Istio, do you automatically get listed on some website or something? So there, there's a technical aspect to that, mm -hmm. right? But but it's it's we're we're consumers of it. We are not producers of it, right? So that that's really the only corner where I see us putting our toes into what I would consider a technical pursuit, right? I mean, we're 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 basically legal license nerds and librarians, right? And and. That's kind of the goal. I don't, I, I don't, listen, we, we're already members of the Linux Foundation. We're already members of, like I said, 30 different organizations. I don't want to create another one. I mean, that'd be reductive and a waste of time. So that actually brings up another good question. Do you see yourself moving forward 
removing yourself from these other bodies or possibly moving more and more Google projects away from those bodies? Well, so Dan, you have to realize at Google, those 3,000 30-day active projects, um, I think 12 are in foundations. So foundations are actually unusual for us. Uh, and so no, I, I don't see us changing our relationship. The reason we joined the Linux Foundation was not because of uh, their, their hosting of projects. The reason we joined the Linux Foundation was because it supported Linus developing Linux. The reason we, we created the CNCF was for it to be a host of Kubernetes, right? So, you know, I, I don't see any reason that we would exit them, you know, um, any more than we would exit the W3C when we ran the other direction with what the what working group, you know, so. There's some confusion as to um, what what things are trademarked and what's what's registered and what's not. Um, mm -hmm. Can you clarify? Uh, to a degree, I can. So I'm actually not a lawyer, right? Um, so uh, the Istio trademarks are sort of in this state of uh, of suspension, but not suspension like you would think of it like a process. Um, so if you look at the path of trademarking, we can hold a trademark as Google and then transfer that to another entity while the trademark office is determining its status. Uh, and we can actually hold trade. This is another very odd thing about trademark law, as I understand it, where we can hold a trademark to something prior to actually filing with the trademark office. Now, if I put on my, my other Google hat, I actually run patent search and that has an intimate relationship with the trademark search uh, group at the USPTO. So these are one of those things where it's, uh, it's pretty unusual how things work and what assumptions you can make. So for instance, uh, OUC does not have possession of, of the Istio Garrett or Angular trademarks or trade dress, or service marks, logos yet because we just formed a company and it takes time to move the things over. So, but that's all in process. Uh, and so you've talked a couple times around trademarks is a goal of the OUC to eventually take all of the IP around. So like currently the IP no, 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 is no, no, assigned no. via Apache V2. Is the charter no. only no. trademarks? No, no, no. Yeah, we, we don't want to have anything to do with creating new open source licenses. We do not want to take in projects, copyright patents. Those are already covered by the open source licenses. That is an anti-goal of, of the OUC. So, yeah. No, Daniel, I, the yeah. thing I was interested in, it was hammering out a path for hardware, but that's, that's later. That's just like a dream for me. Dan, Dan Wilson asks if there are plans to move Istio from a non-trademark perspective to an open source foundation. And, and, and I asked Dan, and I don't know if you want to clarify, I don't know what assets would be transferred because I think that when you, when something is donated to a, to a foundation, the only thing that gets assigned literally is, is ownership of the, of the trademark. Well, so it's interesting because if you look at uh, the CNCF, the LF, and a number of other foundations, you'll find projects that have not had their trademarks transferred over. And in fact, the Linux Foundation bylaws and the CNCF bylaws accommodate that um, by allowing a two-thirds vote of some, some committee that would allow them to take on projects without trademarks. So that's actually happened a number of times across the Linux Foundation in its history. So but that's, you know, angels on the head of a pen. Um, you know, the answer as to what's Istio going to do with this or that, I mean, that actually falls to the Istio subcommittee. And I, I have nothing to do with that. I mean, I, I'm friends, but, you know, this is, this is your world, not mine. Uh, Stephen, uh, Steve Dick asks <laughs> when the OUC charter will be shared or will it be shared? Um, so this is the other side of things. To be, I want to be super frank. I'm actually not a big fan of the big marketing push and all the rest. The reality is when you create a new company uh, outside of Google, it's going to be news. So we voted in the initial board members, I think it was two days ago. We got an EIN yesterday. We're voting in the bylaws next week. And then, it, it, so, so like all these things are in progress, you know, and I'd love to honestly never do any press at all, <laughs> but 
Yeah, the reality is you have to, right? So, so there's a lot of things that we're still putting together and then we can share it, you know? Yeah, I mean, my, my goal is that the, the guidance document for trademarks is something that we just edit in the open and anyone anonymously can just come and check out and, and maybe even comment on it, so. So we're running up to the top of the hour. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to tell people is that this doesn't affect governance much as donating to the CNCF would not have affected governance. CNCS does not take over governance of projects. Each project is governed individually, writes their own rules of governance. Uh, we've had a, a public governance doc for years now, and we have a, we, we had a bunch of private discussion and, and uh, we thought it would be best to have that discussion in public. We want to be very clear. We are working actively to um, get more involvement. Uh, I think we have a lot of maintainers from different companies. We now have four companies on the TOC. Uh, we'd like to get more companies represented and individuals represented in the steering committee as well. And so if you go to uh, a GitHub uh, community repo, um, you'll see there's a pull request by me, Oak Towner. Um, and, uh, and that is where it's, it's a public pull request. It's open for comment right now on our proposal to uh, not just work for, but ensure that we get uh, more diversity. Right now, everybody on the, on the committee is either from IBM or Google or Red Hat. Um, and we want to see more companies there. Um, so we are moving towards more open governance. I will add self-servingly, much more open governance than many projects that are in the CNCF. So um, thank you, Louis, for putting the, putting the pull request in there. So we welcome your comments there. Um, we do think that this project uh, is dependent. We have, a, we have a very vibrant community around it right now. Um, very happy of the number of people who from different companies who are committing time on their own time on their, you know, with, with company, uh, on company time as well. Uh, we want to continue to encourage that. Um, having someone who's not Google hold the, the license for the trademark, we think is good for that. Um, getting more open, uh, getting more participation in our already open governance process is also uh, good. So I invite your, your commentary there. Um, and uh, yes, I guess we did announce last week, I couldn't be here, but and, and I was gonna say, and, and now we do have our fourth uh, company represented on the uh, TOC with Neerich Potter from, um, or Potter from uh, uh, Aspen Mesh joining. So with that, if people wanna stick around, they're welcome to, I do have to leave. Louis, you have something to say? Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I, I can stick around for a bit um, if people wanna ask questions, um, et cetera, et cetera. Louis does sit on the, on the, on the TO t t technical oversight committee as well as the steering committee. So Chris, and thanks for coming. Everybody stick thanks around. So and, uh, please, please pepper Louis with questions. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody. Bye. Now. Louis, I don't want to end the meeting on you. Um, but it says if oh, I you leave, can, you I... Can't read it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you're says, the host. I'm the host, right? And I need to transfer okay. it, and I don't don't know how. So <laughs> just right, like, right click on Louis's name, and then see if you can okay. be a make host. Oh, right. Got it. Okay, I'll try that. I, I don't claim to be a Zoom power user either, Steve. Yeah. Okay. You're all set. Thanks. Okay. Wish I knew that earlier. Just a bit of ed education. It when so it uh, and I, I guess time left. But um, if a if a found, if a project is donated to say the CNCF and the trademark isn't transferred, what is donated then? That is an know. excellent question. I, I am not a like so like there are examples today. Um, I'm not actually sure. Okay. Right. Uh, this a lot of what CNCF does is marketing. Right? So maybe it's it's not right. that yep. the project is donated. It's that the, no, no, the, the, the project the project is donated. The 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 goods and the wares and the bits and the uh, the code. Um, th those well, they, they, right, that, uh, you have the the Apache license, right, which covers the code, mm -hmm. right, and the patents, and so the trademark CLA is elsewhere. Does it not? Right, the, 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 right, the CLA. So that's the, the key DTO. detail. So the right. Button? CLA so, or the DCO. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right, because that's really uh, what gives a lot of power in these projects with respect to, because that effectively gives you license to relicense, right? Right. Uh, so that is, that is what 
pretty cliche. So Again, I'm, I'm not going to be a lawyer, but so today, CLAs so are normally... CLA, I'm not a lawyer, right? So They're normally protective for the body that's receiving the copyright. They're not... Yes. They're not designed to enable the body receiving the copyright to then go and do enforcement outbound, right? That's not what they're for, right? They're, so they're, they're kind of to indemnify the body that receives the, the notice. But again, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah. Um, I guess it's probably CLAs like, have had, eventually rolls up to like existential questions like what is an open source project and stuff. Right? So I, I guess the other thing that was I don't actually know the answer to. So. You, agree, you agree to be bound by the bylaws of the foundation. Okay. Right, but it's not a legally enforceable thing. It's done by virtue of the, the good nature of the maintainers and the body, right? You, you, you agree to submit. Okay. Right. And the licenses within the source code and the repos really drives how you can use the code, whereas the trademark is really there for other vendors doing reselling and what they can do with the name and the logo and other right, representations yeah. that identify the, the project itself. Pretty much are mostly for vendors, right? Yeah, it's mostly for vendors. Usually. Gotcha. So it's largely who, who has the power to change, like, or um, set the license agreement. And then there's this other thing. And in four, right, Mark and is like, who, who's, who has legal authority or allow, allow to grant people permission to use the name in marketing, whatever. I mean, so, CLA so, so, as a license yeah. agreement is interesting, right? I mean, it's it's normally I as a developer write the code. Right. I have copyright. I grant license to the foundation. Right. I still hold the copyright because I wrote it right. logically. But the foundation um, can dictate how a vendor can go and create another offering and resell um, their offering using the brand, the trade, trademark, the name, yeah. the logo in their offering. Yeah. So, so code that's copyright a specific example. Yeah, like as a specific example, the CNCF administers who can use the Kubernetes trademark, but they delegate to the Kubernetes uh, architecture SIG, I think, is responsible yeah. for the conformance tests, right? right? So CNCF says, so long as you, know, you are allowed to use the Kubernetes trademark in your managed offering of Kubernetes, so long as the Kubernetes community gives that the thumbs up. And the, right. community, and the Kubernetes community has defined that thumbs up as conform passing our conformance tests. And so it's really like that, that administration of that usage is really what the CNCF or like the OUC in this case would do. Right, and then the CNCF legally has the authority if they needed to enforce the usage of the Kubernetes name or logo in any offering could do so against a body that wasn't compliant to the conformance tests. So so yeah, the the file lawsuits. Is the OUC now the entity that has the power to do that, that stuff? And Fundamentally, yes. Okay. Cool. To find a like open source project governance for dummies um, blog post oh, or something like that. To, <laughs> well, if you find that, that I send it over. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you're gonna have to give it to everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the other material thing here, right? Like, and when most people talk about governance, they talk about how decisions get made, right? Either technical or another nature with a within a project. Right, uh, Istio in some ways is somewhat forward-looking in this regard that we actually strictly separate technical decision-making in the project from marketing and or other decisions. Uh, that's why we have a TOC and membership on the TOC uh, while currently is stipulated by Istio steering, we we're, we're desperately want to change that and we try to operate not like that, right? One of the one of the founding principles in Istio has been, look, you have to put in your time doing technical work to be on the TOC, right? You're expected to be a working group lead. You're expected to do useful technical things. Uh, and so we kind of have this almost tenuring requirement, right? You, ha you have to have spent some time doing stuff in the project. Uh, it's not written into the bylaws right now, but it's something I would certainly like to see written into the bylaws for the TOC, but it certainly have be has been how we've operated. Uh, and the, the proposal that's linked for steering, because we, like, you can only do one thing at a time and some, <laughs> I can only do so many of these things at once, let's put it that way, uh, right, is trying to deal with the, the steering charter to make it so that we have not just, I guess, what people term open governance, which means that you've said what your governance model is, but neutral in the sense that, you know, you know for some definition of neutral, you have more than one party making decisions. 
and no one party can be making all the decisions. Um, which is, you know, that's a level of nuance Twitter ain't going to get. But yeah. let's just be honest about it. Is, uh, do, you have a, do you have a, um, I don't know, um, it's, it's like Kubernetes or CNCF sort of has like its end user community sort of as distinct as from the like the people working on it. And obviously there's the community meeting and that sort of thing, but do you, do you have any uh, thoughts on like more stru kind of structured ways to get? Oh yeah, yeah. Feedback? No, we, we very much w want to form something along the lines of a technical advisory board. Okay. At least, you know, that, that's a, a thing, like I, I brought it up in the TOC a couple of weeks ago, because we have features like we'd like to get feedback on. Um, and some of the features may be controversial for users and you like, you, you need that engagement, right? And how to structure it is really important because you're going to like, we're going to make demands of people's time. We want to make sure that, you know, their time is valued and used up in a useful way. Thank um, you, you know, the feature here. I took. <laughs> yeah, Craig is very much trying to drive this process uh, and get volunteers who are willing to spend some amount of time, you know, in, engaging with mostly with technical leadership in the project to answer questions about how they like to see things work. Um, you know, I'm sure users have opinions about non-technical things within the project too, but uh, you know, mostly what we do is technical, so hopefully that's where most of the time gets spent. Right. Um, you know, the topic I talked about earlier about, you know, changing how we do tunneling of some traffic has material consequences for end users that, you know, I'd like to get their feedback on. And actually it was in the con context of that, that, you know, I, I was harassing other folks to think about setting up a technical advisory board. Okay. But yeah, I think we, we want to get the steering stuff, or I personally want to get the steering stuff done first, because that would be the body that would probably run that. Um, Although we could actually run it under the TOC, either like, that would also be fine by me. Yeah, let us um, let us let us know when um, happy to contribute to. I, I don't know if we fi find someone as the end to be like a full on member of a technical advisory board, but would love to give. Right. I mean, but it, I, normally the way these type, um, like we haven't by any means nailed down the details of this. You know, we'd ask for a certain number of hours a quarter to go to a meeting where there would be a reasonably directed set of questions that would have a reasonably, you know, that you could provide detailed answers on that would help guide the direction of the project. Um, yeah, this one's I'm great. figuring out how to work out with release cadences and everything else, right? Because we're shipping software every three months. You know, we have a lot of features we want to get to that don't get delivered, right? If you look at the roadmap sheet, right, you'll, you'll see plenty of stuff that probably is not going to make the 1.7 release, just like any other software project. Um, so helping with prioritization, understanding impact, uh, understanding what you know would be the most important things to see coming up, you know, where points of alignment or points of pain exist for customers, all those types of things. Yeah, I'll pass that on. Uh, in the uh, CNCF end user group, a uh, working group or you know, SIG or something like that has been created around uh, service mesh in particular, which is effectively the yes. FDO group. So, um, yeah, I am on. unfortunately. Uh, I'm not allowed to attend. Yeah, and end users, right? but um, but uh, yeah, I, no, no. I, like so, I'll, there's. I'll pass like, that along to the uh, to to the folks. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, we like I, um, you know, specifically from my point of view, being on the TOC, like I need to, to talk to users to get their feedback about important features on the roadmap, and that should be a dialogue. Yeah. Um, separately, if end users want to gather and you know have a chat and talk about their shared experiences and not have, you know, people with agendas like me show up. Uh, that's totally fine too. Uh, I'm probably not going to be the one setting it up because, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But Craig might, Craig's on the call here. Craig is one of the DevRel folks who sits on steering uh, and does more of these types of things than I do. Yeah, so basically everything we say is, is very true. Um, we're in the process, uh, not sure if Ram's still here, but we're in the process of setting up a, an ecosystem group, which will look after um, coordination with, with vendors, we'll look after marketing and so on, and also be a good place to get um, 
people involved in a, an advisory capacity. So some of that might be setting up a, a user group, regular conversation for people to have between themselves. We found in the early days of Kubernetes that that worked really well, is having people who aren't just tire kicking, but are actually using the software in production have a forum to speak to each other. And so Louis obviously mentioned a desire to have input and we'll find a way to coordinate that around the engineering schedule. Okay. Thanks. Um, any, any other any other questions? I'm happy to stick around. Uh, while it is nominally lunchtime, I hear my lunches tend to be pretty curtailed and I can make a grilled cheese sandwich pretty quickly at this point. I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> Although my grilled cheese sandwiches have become more ornate. It's now about the which of the four different types of pepper I'm going to put on my grilled cheese sandwich at this point. Fancy ketchups, Dijon ketchup. Uh, yeah, I, I stay away from ketchup. Is, in my is the governance around the, those choices, is that open? Can we, can we influence those decisions? Uh, the, the which peppers? Well, I, peppers. I have, yeah. let's see, I have cherry peppers, Calabrian peppers, banana oh. peppers, and uh, pepperoncini. Which which do you oh, recommend? All four. <laughs> the, the Calabrian peppers are pretty hot. Right? I, I have to be in a, a specific done. mood. All right, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll be having a glass of milk with my sandwich today. <laughs> um, yeah, so much of Zoom today is talking about what you had for lunch. <laughs> because you have no one else to tell anyone else that you, what you had for lunch. Mama, Mama Lil's? What? Is that a type of pepper? I might have to look that one up. Um, well, already, I think people are doing actual work at this point. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you all. All right. I will, I will now figure out how to end the meeting if I am the host. Take care. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Uh, if you want to make me the host, Louis, um, I can end the meeting. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. Hold on. Sorry, Ram. I didn't want to hold you hostage. Oh, it's okay. Uh, I'm Istio Community. Yeah, there you are. Okay. There you go. Okie dokie.